Hey, so first of all, thank you, Janessa, and thank you very much for the organizers giving me the opportunity to tell you a bit today about our work on, especially in the area of deep learning machines. Um, I should also acknowledge the contribution of uh, my collaborators, Paul Lee and Alexander Mosaika. Both of them were research associates who worked with me on the subject and, of course, did most of the heavy lifting. And uh, Paul Lee is currently a lecturer in uh, Harbin Institute of Technology in Shenzhen, and Alexander works in industry. So because this is quite a broad, uh, broadly uh, accessible um, lecture, I'm going to spend some of the time on explaining what is machine learning, what is neural networks, artificial intelligence, and what are the open questions. Then I'm going to focus on the application of statistical mechanics to the learning in learning from examples in uh, deep learning machines and why entropy in the uh, function space matters. I'm going also to talk about very relatively briefly about related setups that we have investigated, like um, so deep learning machines are parameterized by weights that can take either continuous or real uh, or discrete values. They can be connected uh, through uh, sparse or dense connections between layers. There can be correlated weights. There, there is something that is called convolutional neural networks. Um, and I should go back. Um, there is some sensitivity to input perturbation, binarization of weights where they can take only two values, specification of weights where you prune some of the values of the parameters. But I'm not going to review all of this in detail, just give you a flavor of what it is like. Then I'm going to go to the next research uh, area that I'm going to introduce, which is the typical function space computed, computed by deep learning machines and the relation between that and recurrent networks. And I'll finish with some summary in future work. All of the original work related to this particular presentation is in these three papers. Sorry, David, just before you uh, continue, can I just uh, share the screen for, for the benefit of people who are just don't think so? All right. <clears throat> Okay. I wonder if it's a shortcut that we have it right Okay, good. So the first thing that I want, can you please remove the Simon's hand? And just, okay, good. Um, so the first thing that I want to uh, talk about is what is machine learning because uh, the term has been slightly hijacked by people who are working in deep neural networks and a lot of people think, okay, machine learning is simply deep uh, uh, neural networks, but it isn't. It is only part of machine learning and just in order to put things in order, the overall set of uh, methods that can address things that we consider very vaguely as intelligent, people, uh, humans do and machines don't, is called artificial intelligence. Within artificial intelligence, there is, intelligence, there is an area of data-driven machines, methods, that is called machine learning, and the emphasis here is on data-driven. And within that, there is a small area that is called deep neural networks, neural networks and deep neural networks, which is part of that. Just in order to uh, explain how small this area is, so I took this figure from the book of my ex-PhD student, David Barber, who is now a professor in UCL, and he describes all of machine learning as two separate lobes. The orange lobe is what is called supervised learning, where we have both inputs and outputs of examples, you know, the base of that we are trying to understand what is the underlying function. And the green one is uh, what is called um, unsupervised learning, where we just have examples. And on the basis of that, we try to find the probability distribution function that represents the data. So if you magnify this little part of supervised machine learning, you will find parametric, semi parametric, nonlinear functions. And part of that, this is more or less fits the the, the description of deep learning machines. 
So as I said, machine learning is based on examples and what can it do for us? So the first thing is regression. So we have some function that is characterized by some parameters like the delay in, in, in uh, going through a road depending on the number of the vehicles. And we can, on the basis of data, find the best representation, the best values for the parameters in order to model this function. The next one is classification. For instance, we have these handwritten digits and we are trying to find out which digit it is. And there are some instances that neither machine nor human will be able to understand what we actually uh, wanted to write. Uh, the next two items are somewhat related together, dimensionality reduction and visual informatics. And the idea is how to take a high dimensional representation and uh, project it onto two dimensions or three dimensions so that we will be able to understand what is happening. So in this particular case, we have 12 infrared measurements of oil pipes, and we are trying to infer from that whether we are in the laminar, turbulent, or mixed state. So if we just do principal component analysis, it's still a mess. We can't really see it very clearly. But if we apply more sophisticated methods, uh, we will be able to uh, separate it into three distinct groups so that we will be able to say that these are the measurements, these are the readings, we'll be able to say in which state the system is. Uh, probabilistic modeling, optimization, and inference are also uh, very known applications of uh, machine learning. Actually, it probably should be in that direction. No? Okay, good. So what are the big successes of machine learning? So there are a lot of successes in computer vision. If you look at the papers from the uh, uh, last decade, you would think that distinguishing dogs and, and cats is the most pressing problem that humankind should have to face. Because there are a lot of papers about trying to distinguish between images of dogs and, and cats. Uh, but actually, generally, in computer vision and, 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 and visualization, there is a lot of work and very successful work in by machine learning, especially by deep learning machines. In speech recognition, they've done very well. In terms of playing games, I think that uh, one of the most spectacular successes is that in 2016, uh, AlphaGo managed to uh, beat Lisa Dahl, who, who was 18 times world champion in Go. Um, um, composing music, artwork, generating fake video, and the celebrated ChatGPT. So this is actually an answer for my, one of my coursework questions the student put in, because that's what he got from ChatGPT, and he had all the confidence that this is a correct answer. <laughs> okay, so I already mentioned supervised learning, unsupervised learning, I want to explain what it is. So in supervised, we have data set D, and in supervised learning, we have inputs and outputs. So each one of these data sets represents, for instance, an image of a dog and the classification, an image of a cat and classification and so on. And what we want to learn is the probability of Y output, the underlying function, given X, the input, having seen all of these data sets. So um, classification, regression, and prediction, all of them fall into this category of uh, supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, see, we have lots of data and we want to get a good representation of the data by calculating P of X having seen the data, what is the probability of a new point X uh, that is characterized by the data? Uh, my talk will focus on supervised learning and more specifically on deep learning machines. So if deep learning machines and machine learning in general is so successful, so, so what are the real open questions? What is still unclear? So normally in neural networks, we have some uh, input values that are being fed to the next layer through a product with some weights. And they go through nonlinear function, these the ONG uh, like the units. And then we read them at the output in normal neural networks supervised learning. And the idea is, I mean, most people naively look at it and say, okay, that's fine. So we do deep learning. That means that we add more and more layers and it's quite easy. So what do we need to uh, worry about? So actually 
if you look at VGG16, which was a few years ago, the record-breaking classification and segmentation uh, machine, you can see that uh, it's anything but simple. It includes a lot of engineering understanding and ingenuity in order to construct it. It's not that you get up in the morning and say, okay, I think that this is the number of layers that we want to put. And we want to put some heuristics, convolution, max pooling, fully connected, and all of these things. This requires a lot of work and a very deep engineering understanding. It's also a question, which functions do, you, do they represent at all? What is the space of function that can be realized using deep learning machines? Now, what is called, of course, universal approximators, they can represent any function, but the typical case is something that we are more concerned about. The next thing that is an open question is how to improve training. Because um, training, in most of these cases, is being done using gradient descent and variance of gradient descent. Gradient descent is a method that has a lot of problems with local minima, with not being able to, uh, to, um, to um, uh, converge towards optimal solutions. Um, and next, and so we are looking also for improved training methods. The, que the next question is the impact of examples on the function space. So let's say that we have a completely open function space and we introduce an example. That means we have a constraint on the function space that is usable and still adheres to this uh, mapping, to these constraints. So you can think about it uh, schematically as an area in the function space that whenever we add an example, it shrinks. So if it is deterministically, we can say, well, each time it shrinks by a certain amount, and eventually we will focus, if we introduce enough examples, we will focus on the right representation in function space. Probabilistically, it's a little bit more vague, but still you can look at the entropy of this function space uh, and how it shrinks uh, with time. The next two lines, and one of them is hidden, uh, are explainability and interpretability, and what do the internal representations show? And this is extremely important because you're not going to undergo some medical procedure because the computer gave you a value of 5.6. This is not a good enough justification. You have to have a real understanding of why this is so. So if you look at the internal representations and you have a really good realization of that, you can try to find out that the input was transformed into some sort of features, which combine transform to other features, which eventually give you something that is meaningful. So you will be able to explain to the investor, to the patient, to someone who depends on this critical decision-making, why this is the situation. So this is uh, explainability and interpretability, and it hinges on the internal representations. Okay, I don't know. What should I point it to? Okay. So um, what is deep learning machine? So as I explained before, neural networks is basically uh, nonlinear units that are connected to a set of ways. We get some input X, which we propagate through the layers by multiplying by a set of weights that we are changing as part of the learning process. And it feeds through the layers until we get to the output layer Y. And this represents F function depending on the parameters W of the input X. And the data points are some inputs and outputs related to the various patterns that we show. And at the end of the day, we want to understand the underlying function that is represented by that, so that when we introduce a cat, we will have a labeled cat at the end of the process. I also want to mention that each one of the nonlinear functions realized by these neurons, so-called neurons, is a nonlinear unit. Um, Sometimes it's a sine function, which takes the value of plus or minus one, depending whether the argument of the function is positive or negative, and the rectified linear unit, which is zero if the argument is negative and linear afterwards. What we would like to understand is how comes that deep learning machines generalize well, in spite of the fact that we, are, that we have a large number of parameters and that we are trying to train them using not very advanced methods, uh, what is the nature of the internal representations and which problems are easier or more difficult to solve? Okay. 
technique. This is a recurring problem. It's like the computer's over there. It should be it's linked to the computer. Okay. Okay, sorry, Kieran, I will have to rely on you. Um, so, right. So, and um, I just want to explain before I talk about specifically about uh, deep learning machines, the statistical physics we've been dealing with that for a very long time. Uh, it is can be met to the problem of disordered systems in statistical physics. And one of the advantages of that is we are looking at very large dimensions. Uh, disordered systems simply means that we um, impose, say, a certain number of uh, certain values of weights on the machine, and we can repeat that many times in order to do what we call quench average. Quench simply means that these values remain fixed throughout uh, the, the uh, analysis process. And uh, the, the fact that they are infinite dimensional is very good because it enables us to concentrate the probabilistic mass of the parameters of interest in such a way that we can deal only with the means rather than full probability distribution for each one of them. Um, so a lot of uh, typical, be ah, yeah, the other thing is that it provides typical behavior rather than the worst case scenarios that theoretical computer science usually deals with. A lot of work has been done on storage capacity, how many patterns can a, can a machine store, and what are the generalization curves, but they're mostly for single layer machines because it's otherwise becoming very, very difficult. So the analysis even for two layer systems is becoming uh, extremely difficult. One of the um, areas in which we had great successes in the 90s was to analyze online setting with uh, gradient descent, where each time step we introduced a new example, which decorrelates the example in, examples in time, and we could come up with uh, nice equations. And I, I did a lot of work on that during the 90s, which became now more popular because people tried it to employ it in order to understand the features that emerge in, uh, in uh, online learning, still with two, two layer machine, two layers only. I also want to say that I'm not the only one that thinks that uh, physics is a great uh, set of tools in order to understand deep learning machines. So the Milner Award of the Royal Society for Computer Science was given this year to Stefan Malin, he's a, a, a mathematician from the Corner of Mark Superior, and the title of his talk is From Deep Network Mysteries to Physics. So I think he probably believes that this is a good idea as well. Okay, so the scenario that we are going to investigate is very similar to um, something that has been done before, which is teacher-student scenario. So what does it mean? It means that we believe that there is an underlying process, similar to the one that we are trying to learn, that is generating the examples. So we have the teacher on the left and the student on the right. So in the teacher, teacher machine, which is fixed, we are feeding inputs into the first layer, we get the output at the end layer, and we provide these pairs to the student in order to change the values of the student parameters in order to match as, 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 as well as possible the performance of the underlying uh, teacher network. So what are the difficulties? So this works quite well with two layers, but the difficulties in multi-layer systems are that, um, first of all, they are, um, the, the mapping is very complex. At each layer, it's a nonlinear mapping of a set of parameters with all the variables in the previous layer, so it becomes more and more complicated. The second one is that in each one of these layers, there are symmetries. The immediate symmetries are what is called permutation and reflection. Permutation simply means that we can move each one of the nodes instead of being at, at point one to be in point two or three or four or five, whatever permutation you like, and we'll give you exactly the same answer. Similarly, reflection, if it's a symmetric nonlinear representation, uh, you can multiply all of the inputs by minus one, the output by minus one, and the result does not change. So that means that we have a lot exponential number of possible realizations of the function, and our, especially our gradient descent algorithm will become very, very confused by that. Okay, right. So this is the, the background for my first 
um, the, the first research work that I'm going to talk about. And the point is as follows. So what we want is to, um, to see if we have a reference, the underlying, um, um, the underlying machine, how many functions do we have that represent a good approximation to this function? Why does that matter? Because in reality, the data is noisy. The training methods are suboptimal. So it's more relevant to look at what is a good approximation to this function rather than how can we get to the actual function. Um, and the conjecture is that the entropy or log volume of functions at some error distance from the underlying reference function is what we are after. We would like to have many of those so that it will be easier to find a good approximation. And people have tried to do that, by the way, uh, from the Turing group uh, of uh, Ricardo Zetina, Carlo Baldassi, and others. We're trying to do that as an algorithm by incorporating entropy on top of the cost uh, in, in, in uh, the gradient descent uh, algorithm. But we come from a different direction. So you can think about it, um, the figure B on, on the right, as um, as a function or set of functions in parameter space. Parameter space is a state of all weights that are connecting the different layers. And if we change them by a little bit, there is a possibility that we will get an almost equally correct result, or that if we change them by a little bit, we already get something horribly wrong. So intuitively, I think that it's quite clear that if we fall in, uh, in, in, onto a function in this area, we are quite okay. We will be able to throw something at it and it will fall in the right place and we will get a good approximation. Well, now we can map that onto the function space and this is the space that we are interested in. Um, so in the case where we have a lot of almost correct functions, we can say that many different functions with a small error will be there. Otherwise, we are going to have real difficulty in getting a function that is uh, uh, close to the correct to the reference function that we are after. Okay, so similar to the student uh, teacher scenario that I talked about before, we are following exactly the same structure, only that we have a reference function f a, a w hat, and we have perturbed function which we induce the perturbations on the functions f of w. So we look at the um, set of functions that represent w hat perturbed by into w, and how many functions do we have with epsilon distance from the original function. So we start with exactly the same functions, we perturb them, and we try to find the overlap between the vector of all parameters and the performance uh, in, in both uh, questions. So we are going to look at variables that take the values plus minus one, and the function itself is a sine function, and we introduce a perturbation to uh, w. Uh, what is hidden here is that uh, it, um, there was a somewhat similar work with different variation, different direction by uh, Poole et al. in 2016. But they addressed uh, different problems. And yeah, and the one thing that I forgot to mention can be extended to real values, different functions, and so on. So this is probably the most mathematical uh, slide, so I'll explain it uh, carefully. So for each layer, the field induced by the previous layer is the dot product, product of what we have in the previous field, set of variables W, and you just normalize it by square root of n in order to make this term to be of order one, because n is supposed to be very large, and you want variables to be of order one. So for each one, so this is the, the, the um, reference function. So the probability of the variables at layer L to take a value plus minus one depend on the field or the overall contribution from the previous layer in an exponential way, such that um, a beta, which is just a coefficient, S I L H I hat L. And if it's large, then it will become more like one. If it's negative, it will become more like uh, minus one. 
And beta is called in physics the pseudo inverse, uh, the inverse temperature, and it's uh, just a parameter that says how strictly we follow the alignment between uh, H and, and S. So this is usually done in statistical physics for uh, the dynamics of systems. We replace the time by layers, but kept exactly the same structure. And a similar expression exists also for the um, perturbed system. So what is it good for? So if we have the joint probability of the whole process, we can calculate any objective that we are interested in. So we have some observable O, and we want to find the expectation value of this observable, and it can be done by summing over all possible stochastic dynamics through layers of the system, starting from the same value for both S hat and S uh, itself at zero, and it's propagating through the different probabilities. Now, what happens in statistical physics is that when you do these exercises, eventually all the parameters emerge. All the parameters are summations, like magnetization, which is the summation of all values of S. One over N is very large. So this represents this magnetization is a very narrow distribution because N is very large. So it is sufficient, it's called self-averaging, and it is sufficient to look at the mean value, which is this magnetization. And similarly, there is magnetization for the unperturbed reference framework. And there is another variable, which is the overlap between the two representation, each one of the layers. So these are the main tools that we will be using in order to analyze the system. Um, um, so, what it helps us with is that we can replace the, um, this simple representation that I talked about before by a representation that is based only on the macroscopic or the parameter, the self-averaging properties. Um, in order to do that, to calculate the magnetization and overlap, we employ a method well known from many different areas in physics, which is generating function or characteristic function, we introduce an exponent uh, to the power of psi s, psi hat s, hat psi s. And by differentiating whatever expression we have here, which is average over the whole trajectory, whenever we differentiate it with respect to psi or psi hat and take the psi value to zero, we simply bring down s or s, s hat uh, into the um, uh, average brackets, and we get the expectation value of either the magnetization expectation of S or the, um, the overlap. Um, this is not enough because this is for a given set of uh, reference functions weights in uh, WA. So what we want is to look at all possible representation taken from some uh, probability distribution, say Gaussian, and this is represented by this uh, uh, over bar, which says let's whatever we got from, from the generating function, let's average that over all possible reference functions, reference networks. This is called quenched average. And at the end of the day, what happens is that we can represent it as an exponential dominated by some values of the overlaps. And this is what we are interested in and what we are doing. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's go back. So we said that uh, one of the other parameters that we were looking at was the overlap between the functions represented by the reference machine and the perturbed machine. And um, if we look at the um, expected error, which is the hemming distance between the variables of S and S hat, averaged over time uh, layers, averaged over uh, the, what is called the quench average, different representation, it's simply one half of one minus QL, just to explain what it means. So if QL, the overlap between the two uh, systems is uh, exactly one, they're identical, the error will be zero. If they are completely orthogonal to one another, it's going to be half, which is around this. So in between the two, we have a measure of how, what is the alignment between the two systems and the performance of the two systems. And this maps again to the same figure that I had before. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, again, slightly busy uh, slide, but I think it's uh, 
not difficult because it simply represents two different scenarios. So we looked at scenarios with continuous weights and with binary weights. Continuous weights, so we took the weights from some Gaussian distribution and we introduced a perturbation to the original weights by introducing again some sort of a Gaussian perturbation. Uh, we can calculate then on the basis of that the relation between the overlaps and the magnetization from one layer to the next. And we can calculate the total entropy of these perturbations. Now, just to explain, we can use different perturbations in different layers. And the overall budget of perturbations is the sum of this uh, logarithm of uh, eta L. Eta is the parameter that represents the amount of uh, perturbation that we induce uh, for the original weight. So uh, we have the overall weight W and we use perturbations. And the aim is to look at the number of functions that exist in each one of these circles. Uh, Q can be represented by the overlap between the two vectors. That's what this is uh, angle theta. And this is the perturbation that we induce. In binary weights, it's a similar story. The only difference is that binary weights can take only the values of plus minus one, and the perturbation is simply flipping one to minus one or the other way around with some probability p. So if this was the original unperturbed uh, effect, um, um, system, we are introducing a perturbation that simply says with probability one minus p, you, are, you have exactly the same weight as the original, and with probability p, it will be flipped. Again, we can calculate the recursive relation between the overlaps in different layers and calculate the entropy of these perturbations. And they can take different values at different times, at different layers. Um, at the end of this process, we want to see which entropy or the parameters of which entropy are the dominant ones, because all of this is exponential with the number of parameters exponentially in L. So we assume that we can apply the settle point method in order to identify which entropic values, which Qs and, and entiles are the ones that are dominant in this case. And we can do that both for the uh, real valued and binary valued uh, weights. Okay. Okay, so uh, before I go to the results themselves, I want to pictorially explain what is happening. So the results, what the results show is that if W is exactly the same as W hat, there is full alignment. Let's say that we have three layer system with three different sets vectors of weights. So all of them are exactly aligned because it's the same function, exactly aligned with the unperturbed system. If we start introducing perturbations, on a specific envelope of, uh, of errors, uh, 0 0.1, the first ones to get the perturbations will be the final layer. So first it will be the final layer itself, then it will be, as we increase the error, it will be shared by the first and second, and eventually, of course, it's a, it's a random guess, it's completely orthogonal to the, to the perturbed, unperturbed functions. And this is how it is manifests itself in the values of etas, the perturbation parameter in the continuous and binary weight uh, cases. So uh, mirroring what I explained verbally, when we introduce a higher value of epsilon of error, what will happen is that the first, uh, the fourth layer, the first one to be affected would be the fourth layer, and then the third layer, and then the second layer, and only when the, 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 the error is fairly large, the first layer is going to be affected as well. So that means that there is a lot of weight put on the training of the first and second layers and less so on the, on the remainder. What happens with binary weights is also quite interesting. So we again start by introducing perturbations and the dominant perturbations will show on L equals four in this case, then there will be a drop and some of them will be allocated to L equals three and then a drop, and something will be allocated to L equals two, and L equals one will come only last. So these are the most important, I mean, the conclusion of that is the most important ways to get right are the ones at the uh, early stages of the processing. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and another very important uh, element is in training is the dependence on examples. Because what examples um, uh, do, they introduce a constraint that restricts the weights and the functions and the, and the parameters that we can allow. So um, just as an example, let's say that this is the uh, number of functions, the volume of functions that can represent the, um, the um, uh, unperturbed, the original, uh, the reference function. And as epsilon increases, as the error increases, this volume increases as well. What happens when we introduce a constraint is that some of this, of this volume is irrelevant any, anymore because it is inconsistent with the, uh, uh, with the, um, the example that we've given. So that means that it is multiplied, the volume is multiplied by one minus epsilon because some of them, the epsilon ones, are not going to adhere to the same uh, constraint that is introduced by the example. And as we increase the number of examples, this is called a nilled theory of learning. We decrease the volume. And the higher the epsilon is, the decrease in volume is more dramatic because there are more functions that will not be consistent with the example. Um, so what we try to do, um, yeah, I'll just mention one more thing, that the number of free of examples should scale with the number of free parameters. And in this case, the number of free parameters is L, the number of layers, and squared if it's um, completely uh, fully connected. So we need a lot of examples in order to, to train the network. Our hope was that with the introduction of more layers, the decay will be faster, but we got exactly the wrong results. And I think that we have three reasons for that. The first one, the analysis is correct only for small epsilon or large number of examples. The second one is that we use the sign activation function. Now, as we will see later, the sign activation function keeps many, many possible functions open, the possibility of uh, realizing many, many different functions. And therefore, it is not decreasing exponentially, the volume does not decrease exponentially with the number of examples. Also, we use random, random examples rather than structured examples, which is the case in most of the real world applications. So we do have also correlated weights and, 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 and structured examples, but that's a different world. So an interim summary. So in this part of the work, what we did was to look at, uh, at dense architectures, so densely connected uh, layers and random networks and so on. But we've also extended the same kind of analysis to sparse architectures where elements in each layer are connected only to a small or the one elements from the previous layer. Um, in this case, we also set all of the weights to be one and the disorder is the, in the topology, the connection between different layers and the variables here become Boolean <laughs> gates instead. Uh, we also looked at weight dilution and discretization. So how the accuracy of uh, deep learning machines is being uh, eroded by replacing the continuous weights by plus minus one weights and or simply pruning some of the weights uh, randomly. And we did that for the ReLU and sine function and we looked at continuous variable values. Again, ReLU, this type of function, we looked at conv convolutional neural networks and correlated weights and input sensitivity and a lot of other things. And if you're really keen, you can really get the papers. But now I'm going to move to the next uh, item on the list. If Karen will let me, yeah, thank you. So, um, and this is about what actually is the distribution of function that is represented by deep learning machines. So as an introduction to that, let's consider the case in which we have only two inputs. So if we have two inputs, we can have four possible input vectors, plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, minus. And for each one of them, we will have two possible outputs. So the space of functions is 16 possible functions. That's two nodes, four vectors, 16 possible functions. So these are the possible inputs and the functions, Boolean functions are a representation of four possible, uh, the, the 
four possible inputs and a function for each one of them. So the questions that we are trying to answer are the following. The first one, what is the distribution and entropy of functions generated by deep learning machines? That means how, when we have deep learning machines, do they converge to a single function or can they um, represent many, many different functions? The second one is the space of function generated by deep learning machine and recurrent network of the same size. So just to explain what is deep learning machine versus recurrent. So in deep learning machine, we go from layer to layer. It's a unidirectional process. In recurrent network, and I'm sorry about my poor graphical um, skills, the idea is that all of the weights are going from the output to the input repeatedly. So a recurrent network, we simply feed them again and again and again and again. And here we have only, if it's fully connected, all the n squared parameters. Here we have L n squared parameters. Um, and a spoiler, uh, one of the results that we are going to get is that both representations cater for exactly the same function space. OK, so we calculate it in a similar way, but I want to uh, explain the differences. So let's say that we have a certain lowercase n is the number of inputs, and we feed them through our networks, and the network goes from layer to layer, or in the case of recurrent network, from time step to time step. And again, we can represent the probability of, um, of output at layer capital L, the final layer, as a function of the input. The input is mapped onto the first layer, and they are concatenated all of these uh, probabilities are concatenated in the way that we are moving from one layer to the next. Um, so uh, this is just the mapping of the input onto the first layer. And this is some gate that can be uh, one of the nonlinear functions we talked about before, but it can be any other Boolean gate um, that takes the values of the previous layer and map it to SLI. In this case, it is completely deterministic. We do not allow for some parameter beta that will uh, um, um, make it a little bit more flexible. Okay. So I was talking about a single input. However, let's consider all possible inputs. So if we have gamma equals 1, gamma equals 2, gamma equals 2 to the power of n, we've covered all possible inputs. So that means that if we have the same topologies in all of these um, deep learning machines, at the end, we will have a full mapping of the function. Because for any input, we will simply go choose the right one and go to the function that represents the output. So the weights and the topology and the architecture are exactly the same for all of these. But the, for different gamma values, for different inputs, they will manifest themselves in a different way through the internal representations. And this is what we're trying to follow. Next one, please. OK, so in terms of methodology, we use more or less the same methodology that I explained before. So what we are trying to do is to look at the, um, uh, at the function f gamma for um, as, as represented by the final uh, layer s i l gamma for all possible inputs and summed over all possible uh, parameter values. We again introduce the generating functional analysis, and I'm not going to repeat the explanations before. But at the end of the day, we find that uh, we average also on the weight disorder. And at the end of the day, we get an overlap Q between L, L prime, two layers, gamma, gamma prime between two patterns. And this is going to be the overlap that will be the other parameter that uh, dominates the, the performance of the system. And we will find what are the optimal values of the overlaps, Q, Q, whatever, uh, through several points, but this is not taken. So one of the interesting things that we have realized is that when we look at a 
the overlap Q L L prime gamma gamma prime. Just to remind you what this overlap means, it means uh, the two vectors are what is the angle between them? Are they fully aligned? Are they completely orthogonal? So we can calculate that by looking at the value of the gate, which can be either Boolean gate or, 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 or ReLU or whatever we have before, given the Gaussian distribution of the fields H for all of these LL prime, gamma, gamma prime, with a certain, with a zero uh, a mean and covariance matrix that is just parallel to this uh, Q as well. And if we do that for layer dependent and recurrent networks, now, this is a very small, small uh, scale experiment because it's only for uh, three layers and uh, four elements, four different inputs. Uh, we can see that the structures are very, very similar to one another. And because the whole calculation is for the deep learning machines, these are not exactly zero for the recurrent network, but asymptotically they will be. So quite a, a similar structure for both. Um, so when we look at um, the architectures of the neural networks and, and uh, layer networks and um, recurrent network, they have exactly the same structure of what is the probability of functions at layer capital L given the whole process that we have analyzed. We can also do this. So this was for densely connected systems where all of the variables are connected between successive layers. But even if we choose only a K, that can be three, four, five, whatever we want, between connections between elements, there is a similar structure that we can also calculate in the same way. And both of them are identical for a current network and for deep learning machines. Okay, just to convince ourselves that it's not uh, something, um, you know, yeah, good. that uh, we are doing, this is really a real, real um, um, phenomena. So we took um, figures from the MNIST database. The MNIST database is that of handwritten digits, and uh, we try to classify them correctly using the two architectures. So we took a recurrent network which has the same weights at each time step and layer network, which has different weights between uh, layers. And we train them on trying to identify this. And this is going from the, with, with different number of hidden layers. And this is the test accuracy. Uh, we did not use a sine, but hyperbolic tangent, which is a similar function that we have like sine, but it's a continuous function and therefore differentiable and therefore can be used using gradient descent. But the, the idea is exactly the same. And as you can see, ignoring the first two layers because they are just mapping the inputs into the layers in the current, you can see that the recurrent, uh, recurrent hyperbolic tangent and the layered dependent hyperbolic uh, tangent results are quite similar. And the same with uh, the ReLU based function. Now, I should say uh, this is quite um, a good result. They are not identical because it is a limited number of uh, um, elements. It, uh, the data is actually correlated and not uncorrelated like what we considered in all of our calculations. Um, so the fact that they are not falling exactly on top of one another is not a big deal. It's a relatively good result showing that recurrent and layer networks have the same um, representation. Also the training, of course, is, uh, is suboptimal. Um, a visual representation of, um, of what is going on can be done also in this very simple case where we have two inputs which we map onto the layers and we, in this case, we use Boolean gates. So we have two Boolean gates, majority three and end. Um, so as I said before, there are two inputs, therefore four input vectors, therefore 16 functions that are represented by these squares and the size of the circle within the, the square says what is the probability of this function being implemented after zero, one, two, three layers. So majority three is a function that is fairly balanced. It says simply we have three inputs and out of these three inputs, if more, two or more are one, it will be one. If two or more are minus one, it will be minus one. This is simply the majority. So it's a balanced one. 
On the other hand, and is an entropy killing machine because out of the four different states, three of them are going to be zero. So that means that the diversity of functions is very quickly restricted, exponentially restricted. And this manifests itself in these figures. If you can see after three layers, the majority being a relatively balanced function will have almost the same probability for each one of the representations of functions. On the other hand, the end will be dominated by one function out of the 16. And this one is actually zero because it will decrease the entropy of functions very quickly towards zero. Okay. And, and further experiments of the entropy for functions with sign and ReLU and different number of inputs and majority and n for different number of inputs um, um, support our uh, understanding. Because as you can see for the sign function, irrespective of the number of inputs, the entropy remains very high. That means that they can represent many different examples as we progress in layers or in time. And the same thing for ReLU is going to, it's going to decay very quickly actually exponentially, because this is a logarithm of the volume, the volume increases exponentially as we increase time or layers. And the same with majority and end, majority being preserving entropies and killing entropies. Now, it's not necessarily all bad for ReLU, because maybe one of the interpretations is that ReLU being decreasing exponentially will require fewer examples in order to reach the correct answer. Because maybe, this is speculation, maybe for the sine function, we have such richness of possible functions that we can represent that each time we're going to chip away just a little bit from this volume of functions, but we are not going to uh, exponentially decay to the correct solution. While ReLU being bad in terms of entropy will be more successful in terms of learning. Okay. And um, so in general, we propose a framework for analyzing function uh, computed by random deep learning machines. And we show the equivalence between the space of functions generated by deep learning machines with <laughs> networks. Uh, we also show how, which I've mentioned, but have not uh, described in detail, that having less parameters uh, is fine in, in, by sacrificing a little bit of accuracy, but um, producing the right result. And it all depends on the gate or activation function in terms of the entropy. What we are currently studying is the impact of the number of examples on the function space. And this turns out to be quite complicated, but we are still, staying and still struggling with it. There is the role of overparameterization in uh, function space. So we have much more capability. How can we get rid of these redundant configurations and to explore the effect of uh, correlated inputs, uh, like from a gen generative model and to optimize the variable given layer size. There's one more slide that I want to show. So until now I talked about artificial intelligence and how everything is being done on silicon. And now I'm going to, in one slide, uh, introduce a project that we are currently working on. It is called New Chief. It's a project funded by that open from the EU. And in this project, we are trying to use uh, human cortical uh, neurons as the building blocks for an integrated circuit. And the reason for that is that they have very low energy consumption in comparison to, uh, to silicon. They have, hopefully, an inherent learning mechanism that was refined and perfected over millions of years. And um, they are adaptive. Now, what we do is our biology friends uh, are taking uh, stem cells that are originally harvested simply as skin cells, but they are developed into stem cells and from stem cells to human neurons. Uh, amazingly, I didn't know that, but you can buy them even on the internet. Um, so, and then they develop them into human neurons. The neural neurons are then put on um, on a, a chip, a high, very high resolution chip that looks like, Karen, help me please. No, not this, this also, but uh, the next slide is if, yeah. So they actually look like that. 
and then they produce now the video. So they uh, produce spikes that we can, in, in response to stimulation, and we are getting a raster plot, which is a firing pattern of the different neurons at different times due to stimulation. And we're trying to learn how uh, the neurons learn, what are the changes, the plasticity that uh, takes place, and how it is related to the um, uh, to the uh, stimulation and activation, and to use that as a, an AI, a logical AI machine. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.